Okay. Well, I think we will get started. It is five o'clock and thank you all for coming. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, can everybody hear me? Jeremy, can you all hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear. Um, what you see before you is a plaque, a commemorative plaque. And that's what today is for, is to be thankful. And we are broadcasting today with this Zoom to folks who have low vision and or blind as well in the community. So this Zoom may be a little different than others because I'll be describing what you're seeing on the screen. So I'm gonna describe this plaque and I'm going to read it. The plaque says, Great Lakes Talking Books, audio, I just said that like a Canadian, did you hear that? Books, audio recording booth, funded by the Victoria E. Hmm. Wolf Estate, Equipment and furnishings funded by Jim Armstrong Memorial, Eunice Vandekavy, dedicated in 2020, that all may read. Now you might be thinking, why does the dedication say 2020? The booth was originally going to be celebrated in March of 2020. And I think we all are very familiar with what happened during that time frame. So this is our second attempt to celebrate the booth. So the purpose of today, and this plaque, by the way, is hanging inside the Victoria E. Wolf book booth, which is housed on the second floor of the Peter White Public Library. So we're very glad to have this and have you here with us today after all of this time. Um, So what you see before you are two photos, one of a woman with pigtails and brown and gray hair and a man with dark hair and a ponytail and back, a blue mask and a red sweatshirt. This is myself, Tanya Bickford and Jeremy Morlock, your co-host today. And Jeremy and I both wear two hats at the Superior Land Library Cooperative. Uh, my first hat is as reader advisor for the Great Lakes Talking Books. And my second is as recording director and monitor for the Victoria E. Wolf recording booth. Jeremy, my co-host today, um, Jeremy Morlock, he is first and foremost, and I need to look over at his title because I can never remember it, is a database maintenance and system administrator assistant with the Superior Land Library Cooperative. And with the Victoria E. Wolf booth, he is the editor and equipment consultant. Before we get going, I just wanted to let you know that our plan for today is such. We want to celebrate, give thanks, give you the history of the booth. We want to talk about how did it get here? Why is it here? Who's responsible for this booth and what do we plan to do with it? We're going to show you a video of the booth. Since we can't be at the Peter White Public Library together, we have a small video as if we're walking up to the booth. We're going to talk about Great Lakes Talking Books, who we are, who we serve, what we do, and how we connect to the Superior Land Library Cooperative. We're going to talk with Doug Payne and Clara Payne, and Doug is going to give us more information about this name we say over and over again, Victoria E. Wolf. So we're excited to have Doug uh, from Kalamazoo with us today as our keynote speaker. We're going to talk about our recording process, how we record a book, the tools we use, what we do with it once we've recorded it. Um, so you can learn a little bit about that, where it goes when it's been recorded. We're going to listen to some of the books that we've re recently recorded, specifically Laughing Whitefish by Robert Traver, John D. Volker. We're gonna listen to 
two clips from our recording that we finished earlier this year. And lastly, we want to talk about our collaboration in partnership with the Peter White Public Library, who grace, graciously housed our very big and heavy booth on their second floor and what they're doing with the booth and the future plans. So with that, um, we'd ask that everybody stay muted and we're going to allow for questions after Doug's presentation. And then we welcome questions at the end of our presentation. So this screen is a snapshot of the Great Lakes Talking Books website. It has our homepage and the Victoria E. Wolf recording booth link. We're showing you the history of the Victoria E. Wolf recording booth. And I'm going to read it to you now. In 2019, Great Lakes Talking Books purchased a recording booth using funds donated by the Victoria E. Wolf Estate with the goal to record books written by local authors and or about the Upper Peninsula. The booth has been installed in the Peter White Public Library and will be available for public use in 2021. Equipment and furnishings were funded by the Jim Armstrong Memorial and Eunice Vandekaven. Okay. So now I am going to show you, for those of you who don't uh, live near the Peter White Public Library, I'm gonna show you a small video of what it's like to walk up to the Peter White Public Library second floor installation sound booth and describe visually what we're seeing to folks who are unable to see that. We start at the second floor of the Peter White Library at the top of the stairs. As a note, there's an elevator to this floor. We pass by the Michigan local collection on the left as we're walking east. And we turn left and we walk by and see a big white cube, a giant white cube with a sign on it that says Great Lakes Talking Books. I almost hit the column when I was filling, filming this. And we see the door of the booth and we step up into the booth. We see the chair where a narrator sits, a microphone boom stand, a microphone, headphones on the table. And we look out at the narrator's view out the window to the monitor station. Sorry about that. So we want to acknowledge a few people today who are very important and are the reasons why the booth exists here in Marquette and will be a public good for many. The first person we want to recognize is Victoria E. Wolf. We wanna thank her family that is here with us today, Doug and Clara Payne. Um, the estate left us um, the funds that we used to purchase the booth that all might read. Um, the second person we want to thank today is Lynn Buckland Brown. And I'm not sure if Lynn is here with us today. Lynn, are you here with us today? Jeremy, have you seen a Lynn? Okay, well, Lynn is pictured no. here. Um, it's, uh, Lynn is a woman with blonde hair and a blue shirt, and she's holding a white dog looks sort of like a poodle and her dog's name is Dory. And there is a light bulb um, over Lynn's head and that is there for a reason. Lynn is my predecessor here at Great Lakes Talking Books and she is the originator of the idea to purchase a local recording booth for the purpose of recording local books with local narrators using the way we say it locally. So Lynn, Thank you very much for all your efforts to make this happen. Jeremy Morlock is also the person who was the equipment consultant, making sure we have the technology we needed to make that goal happen. Sean Andery, the former director of the Superior Land Library Direct Cooperative was also very involved in this process, along with Andrea Ingmeyer of the, the director of the Peter White Public Library. And we wanna thank Doug Payne and his wife, Clara, for being with us today. We really appreciate their time. 
And we wanna thank all the narrators who may or may not be with us today in this meeting, but we wanna thank them for their time narrating our books. So where does Great Lakes talking books fit in with the big picture? And how do they relate to the Superior Land Library Cooperative? Um, we're housed at the Superior Land Library Cooperative, and we are a sub-regional library. We serve all of the UP and Alpena and Crawford County. And we are a sub-regional library for a regional library in Lansing called the Braille and Talking Book Library, which is part of the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons, which is part of the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. We are all under the umbrella of the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled in Washington, the Library of Congress. And so the answer to the question of once we record a book, where does it go? It goes to the National Library Service. Okay. A little bit more about us. I'm going to describe the words you would find on our website if you asked, if you went to our home website, greatlakestalkingbooks.org, this is what you would see. We serve residents of the UP and Alpena and Crawford counties in the Lower Peninsula. We are part of a national network of cooperating libraries with the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, otherwise known as NLS. NLS provides a free Braille and talking books library service, circulating books and magazines in Braille or audio formats that are instantly downloadable to a personal device, quote, using the BARD mobile app, or delivered by mail for free. Individuals all ages are eligible for service provided they meet any of the following criteria. So this is what I want people to pay attention to because it's not just for blind people, it's for people who are blind or have a visual impairment that makes them unable to comfortably read print books, have a perceptual or reading disability. Reading disability is in bold because that's a new qualification that does not need a doctor to sign the application. Um, so that is something that the National Library Service has a marketing campaign to let people know reading disabilities are accepted have a physical disability that makes it hard to hold or manipulate a book or to focus or move the eyes as needed to read a print book. Let's check out the website and online application for more about our services. So I'm gonna take you now to our website. And here's our website. And I'm taking you here because many of you work in a library and all librarians and library paraphernalia paraprofessionals and social workers and hospital staff and activities directors and welfare agencies and nurses and optometrists and therapists can certify our applications. And they can click here where it says certifying authorities, submit applications online. If you click on that link, they can submit an application for our services on behalf of the patron and certify that application. I just wanted to show you that app. It says the same things that are on our website, gives you some additional information and it's an online form. And when you fill out that form, a copy of this form in PDF format is emailed to you, the certifier of the application. There is also a link on our website for folks who are not certifiers but want to bring the application to their social worker or their therapist or their caregiver to help them find someone to certify their application for them. They can call me and we can talk over the phone and I can fill out the app over the phone for some people too. But here are our qualifying disabilities and here's where someone signs their name, a librarian, a doctor, a nurse, social worker, certifying the application. So I'm gonna back out of our website now. And 
Now it's time for us to meet Doug Payne in Kalamazoo with his wife, Clara Payne. And we asked Doug to unmute himself and we are going to learn about Victoria E. Wolf. I have unmuted. I don't see myself yet though. Uh, you will in just a moment. <laughs> oh, okay. I see myself upper left, all right. I think we're good. Okay, excellent. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Payne. My wife, Clara, is here with me, and I think she might get in the picture for just a second, and then she said she's bowing out. So that, that's Clara's uh, participation for the evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, before I start talking about Victoria E. Wolf, I'd like to give a little personal aside. Um, I was, I grew up in a small village in South Central Michigan, not too far from the Indiana border. Small enough that as I recall, the 1960 census had about 350 people. I didn't actually live in the village, but on the outskirts, if you can possibly live in the suburbs, of a, a 350 person village, I did on a small farm, but the village had a library. And it was open a couple of days a week, Saturday and Tuesday, as I recall. And I would pedal my Schwinn bike down to the library as often as I could as a little boy. And it seems to me that I would get usually Hardy Boys books. And these were written in the 1920s. They were dusty, musty, dog-eared books. And I loved them. And I got other books over the years and continue to use that library. But I, uh, I came to the conclusion that that little library allowed me to have a lifetime interest in books and in learning. And to my mind, librarians are rock stars. So I appreciate being with you today very much. Let me talk about Victoria E. Wolf. I was the executor of her estate, but for the rest of the evening, I'll refer to her simply as Aunt Vicky because she was my aunt by marriage. Uh, my wife, Clara, was the niece of Aunt Vicky and uh, I married into the family, we'll say over 40 years ago and leave it at that. Um, over the years, Aunt Vicky and I developed kind of a unique way of greeting each other. And I'm not sure exactly how this evolved, uh, but when we would meet in person or when a call would be placed between the two households, I would say, how the hell are you Aunt Vicky? And she would invariably respond, not too damn bad, not too damn bad. She was a youper through and through. She was born and raised in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, she did leave during the Upper Peninsula during her working years, but she returned uh, for retirement. Her father was Eugene Johnson, a Swede. And at the age of 14, he left Sweden and crossed the Atlantic unaccompanied, entered through Ellis Island and moved on to Minneapolis where his older brother was located. He learned a trade, that being plastering and he became, uh, I guess you would call it a master plasterer. Uh, he moved over to the UP and uh, ultimately settled in Sault Ste. Marie. There he met Martha Hutala, a wonderful Finnish name. Um, although Finns would say all Finnish names are wonderful. Uh, the two of them, Eugene and Martha, married and had three girls, the youngest of which was Aunt Vicky. Uh, she was raised, as I said, in Sault Ste. Marie in a house on Prospect Street. 
When she was quite young, the family purchased a small cabin out on Sugar Island in the St. Mary's River. Although I guess when I'm talking to youpers, you all know where the St. Mary's River is and in Sugar Island, so I'm, I'm probably being a little redundant there. Uh, the house is still in the, in the family today. Aunt Vicki graduated from Sioux High. She went on to Lake Superior State to get a bachelor's degree and ultimately secured a master's from Michigan State University. She became a, a teacher, a special education teacher. As I said, she left the Sioux during her working years. She um, traveled down to Stockbridge near Jackson and worked there for a number of years and then moved on to Alpena and finished out her teaching career there. Along the way, she married a man named Emil Wolf, uh, who remains to this day the uh, funniest man I think I've ever met. The two of them together were a stitch. Uh, in Stockbridge, they had a Christmas tree farm. When they moved to Alpena, they purchased a uh, small farm over near Gaylord and created a deer camp. Um, they also purchased along the way over the course of their many years of marriage, uh, a cabin for themselves up on Sugar Island. Uh, and that cabin we, I just sold a, a few years ago. Aunt Vicki, let me explain a few things about her. She was a, she was a hoot. She was a lover of music. She loved folk music, uh, the Kingston Trio, the Weavers. She was a big fan of Broadway musicals of the 50s and 60s and was often singing or humming tunes from those musicals. I'd said she was a youper through and through. She hunted and fished, uh, snowmobiled and cross country skied. She was fun and funny. Now there are a number of people in the, in the world who are neither fun nor funny. Some that are one, not the other, but she was both. And relatives visited her, not because they had to, we all have relatives that we visit because we feel an obligation to visit. With Aunt Vicki, you visit her, visited her because you wanted to. She was adored by her nieces and nephews of whom there were many. She and Uncle Emil never had their own children, but in a sense, they did. She was generous. I, uh, in talking to the attorney after her death, I went to an attorney to seek a little legal counsel to uh, administer my duties. And he was looking at the trust and the will and uh, a sheet documenting her assets. And he said, what did this woman do? And I said, well, she was a, a teacher and her husband was a, a state highway department worker. Uh, I said, but they worked hard, they saved, they invested, they did all the right things. When a bequest was made, the original bequest to the uh, I'll refer to, refer to it as a talking books uh, organization. And that was about four years ago, the original bequest came through, there were actually two. Uh, I had a call from the then director and she said, this is the largest gift that we've ever received with this organization. A few days later, I got a call from a pastor at a small Lutheran church in Sault Ste. Marie. And he said, I'm absolutely floored. We've never had a gift this large before. He asked me if, <laughs> he asked me if they could use it to buy new pews. <clears throat> I said, you can buy new pews if you want. There are no strings attached. You can uh, uh, feed the poor. You can pave the parking lot. You can do whatever you want with it. No stipulations. Uh, and she bequested uh, several other organizations 
as well as uh, providing generous gifts to, by my recollection, 18 different nieces and nephews. So she was generous almost to a fault. Now, why did she give money to this particular organization, the uh, Talking Books organization? Well, it all started with her mother, Grandma Johnson. Um, Grandma Johnson later in life developed macular degeneration. She had been an inveterate reader. And after a few years, she was no longer able to read and uh, was told about the Talking Books organization. She started having those books mailed to her residence. And she continued to do so until the time of her death. She loved romance novels. And I and other grand grandchildren learned that a printed word is not the same as a word spoken, especially spoken loudly. <laughs> uh, grandma was quite deaf. And as we would enter her house and later her apartment and hear one of these romance novels that she had on playing, uh, some of those words that seemed rather benign on the printed page would have made a sailor blush. Uh, after a while, we start re started referring to grandma's books, not to her face, as her crotch books. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, time passed and uh, Aunt Vicky, unfortunately, also developed macular degeneration. And after a few years, she also required the services of the Talking Books organization. Uh, she knew how to avail herself of it. Uh, she had, uh, unlike grandma, uh, a broader palette. She loved uh, fictional as well as non-fictional works uh, historical novels, and uh, she loved humorous works, especially by Garrison Keillor. So that was the introduction to this organization. Um, I want to end with a tangential family story. When I received the invitation, Clara and I received the invitation to attend this evening's activities. Uh, there was a second page and it uh, delineated the um, books that were being recorded by UP authors, uh, written about the UP and narrated by, by UP natives. Uh, and Robert Trevor, as Tanya mentioned, was uh, mentioned in one of his books. He wrote Anatomy of a Murder, but it's another of his books, I believe, that was recorded. Uh, Cully Gage, uh, several of his books were mentioned as either having been recorded or that they would soon be. Aunt Vicky, as I said, was the youngest of three girls. The middle girl, Dolores, was Clara's mother and my mother-in-law, also a wonderful lady. Back in the mid fifties, Dolores, her husband, Al, my wife, Clara, Clara's sister, Chris, all left the UP and went to Kalamazoo. Uh, my mother-in-law, Dolores, started working at Western Michigan U University. She worked in the Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology, and she was a secretary there. And she was a secretary for the uh, head of the department. In those days, the head of the department was a gentleman named Dr. Charles Van Riper. He actually created the department at Western. Dr. Van Riper was a world renowned authority on stuttering. He was a stutterer himself. But Dr. Van Riper had a side gig that I think not many people in Kalamazoo were aware of. He was a writer and he had a pen name and the pen name was Cully Gage. So as I'm talking to you tonight, it, it occurs to me 
that not only are we talking about Aunt Vicky providing monies that help create this recording booth, but the recording booth is producing works that were written by Aunt Vicky's sister's boss. And I guess it's another example of the fact that life is indeed a circle. Uh, we as her family are thrilled by the opportunity to be with you tonight, by the creation of this recording booth made possible through her, through Aunt Vicky's bequest. Um, we're thrilled about the prospects for uh, visually impaired folks across the UP, uh, for the opportunities that they'll have as Grandma Johnson and as Aunt Vicky had over the years. Uh, and the opportunities for people within Marquette and the community. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And I know if Aunt Vicki were here tonight, uh, I have no doubt she would say, it's not too damn bad. I thank you very much. I, I appreciate your attention and uh, good luck to all of you. Does anybody have any, thank you so much, Doug Payne and his wife, Clara yeah. Payne. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions for Doug or Clara? If you do, you need to unmute yourself and let us know. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You're a very good storyteller, Doug, and we just really appreciate that. That just gives us so much more meaning to what we're doing, even more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Take care. Take care. Okay, hey, I'm gonna to return to the presentation. So we've acknowledged folks and now, I'm showing a screen that has three photos, one with a woman in a pink shirt sitting at the recording desk inside of the recording booth. She has brown curly hair and she's smiling with a red iPad. We have a picture of a man with a baseball cap and a beard and a blue and yellow plaid shirt who's smiling. And one of his friends has his hand on his shoulder. And lastly, we have a photo of a man with white hair and sunglasses and a blue coat who's smiling at us. And these three individuals are three of our current narrators, Kelsey Bolt, who also works at the Ishpeming Public Library, the Ishi, sorry about that, the Ishpeming Carnegie Public Library. We have Dan Juntala, who is a retired teacher from Calumet, Michigan. And we have Mark Hamery, who is a local in a band and also has a wallpaper and paint store here in Marquette. There are many other narrators and potential narrators that we haven't thanked today, that we haven't worked with yet, but we hope to work with someday. In 2019, Lynn Buckland Brown sent out an announcement and a press release uh, to the local newspaper to ask for narrators to volunteer. And we have a big list of people who we haven't worked with yet. And we wanna let you know, we haven't forgotten about you. If you're in the Zoom today, uh, we may be in contact soon. So these three narrators um, are working with us. And an interesting note is that before we had the recording booth, Dan Juntala had the distinct pleasure of recording our first book, A Love Affair with the UP by Kali Gage in a quilting room in a local church. 
So Jeremy was there with him. I was there for a little bit, but that was prim primarily Lynn Buckland Brown and Jeremy and Dan Gentila in a quilting room in the basement of a church. That was the best they could find for uh, a soundproof location. And they did quite well with that. Here's our progress report. To date, we have added to the National Library Service catalog for a download for people who have low vision and or are blind or a reading disability or a physical disability. Uh, three books, A Love Affair with the UP by Cully Gage, the pen name for Charles Van Riper. That was narrated by Dan Juntala. The Last Northwoods Reader, book four by Cully Gage. Again, Charles Van Riper. That was narrated by Mark Hamery. Uh, Laughing Whitefish by Robert Traver, John D. Volker, narrated by Mark Hamery. And what we're working on right now is the Northwoods Reader, volume one, Northern Wit and Wisdom by Cully Gage, Charles Van Riper, narrated by Mark Hamery, and Copper Empire, a novel about the Copper Country labor strike in 1913 by Donna Searight Simons. And that is narrated by Kelsey Bolt. This slide has three photos. The top left photo has the laptop computer we use for recording. And it's connected to our recording interface known as the Apollo. And it has a dial for volume settings and headphones. Underneath that photo on the left-hand side is the recording booth as it sits in the second floor of the Peter White Public Library. They painted the booth the same color as the walls in the library and it is, has a big door and it has a sign on it saying Great Lakes Talking Books. The last photo is of the inside of the recording booth with the comfy chair, which doesn't make a lot of noise when someone is recording. That was a requisite uh, that the chair was not noisy when a body sits in it and headphones and the recording microphone and um, headphones. At this time, I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to my co-host, Jeremy Morlock, who will tell you more about our recording process and the tools we use and the process we follow. So here's Jeremy. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Um, you may hear a noisy chair. I have a terribly loud chair here in my quote studio at home. Um, hence the need for a place that is um, completely soundproof um, as Tanya described it's essential and when we were in that church basement we had it was a quilt storage room we it was stacked to the ceiling with the batting material if you know about quilting that's the the foamy kind of material that is sewn into the inside of the quilt so we had that as sort of sound reinforcement um, but we had to make sure there was no one else in the building because the footsteps above could have been a problem and uh, things like that. So uh, I'll, what I'm gonna do is talk about the actual um, steps that we go through, which are pretty extensive. And I have a background in recording audio and editing and mixing and all that stuff, but I had to learn quite a few things um, to make the, the books available to the patrons. Um, according to the rules of the uh, National Library Service uh, along with Tanya. So uh, on the screen here you will see at the top there are some sh uh, squares um, with different steps left to right. Um, there are seven steps on the screen and on the bottom of the screen are some icons that you would see on your computer screen at the bottom to indicate the different programs that you would open up. Now two of these are what we use for this process. The first one is called Pro Tools and that's um, a digital audio workstation um, which is sort of a term DAW DAW uh, that's used for um, computer recording software uh, these days. Uh, that's really been around for about the last 20 years. Um, so it's pretty revolutionary. We're no longer recording actually onto tapes. It's all recording digitally. And then on the right side of the screen is an H, 
which is Hindenburg, a very strange name for software. Um, that's the one that we use for the sort of the final uh, processes of getting the book, um, the files, the audio files ready to be sent on to um, the National Library Service. So the first square at the top left on the screen says record. So the first thing we do is record. We have just the, the narrator sitting inside of that booth with the door closed so there is no outside sound that will um, interfere with the recording and as you know if you've been in a library recently they're not the old-fashioned things where the librarians are running around shushing everybody um, you have meetings going on you have all kinds of of sound a lot of noise in these um, libraries nowadays so you, you this is very important that we have um, this sealed uh, eight foot by eight foot um, um, cube that <laughs> Tanya described and showed you on the screen earlier um, so the person will sit there and there will be a microphone on a stand in front of them and they will be reading the book either from the paper or what we've been doing recently we found works excellently is to read on an iPad or some kind of a tablet so that there's no noise of the uh, turning of pages and things like that but um, anything like that would be edited out later anyway if there were the sound of the flipping of pages or or uh, clearing of one's throat or uh, things like that so the person who is recording which has been Tanya so far for us sits on the outside of the booth those two can see one another through glass and um, actually Tanya can press a button on the equipment that's right there next to the laptop and she can actually speak to the narrator and say oh uh, Mark uh, can you please go back on that last um, sentence you said the wrong word at this one place or you or you um, there was a slight bit of a noise from your shirt or something um, and could you please read it back one more time so that they can communicate to one another and actually maybe we could go to the next screen because I'm going to tell you what happens once it's been recorded. So this is kind of like if you look at the bottom, that's a basic a wave, a sound waveform, how it looks visually. So it just has m parts that go up and down, and you can actually stretch that out um, to the the smallest um, increment of time. So what we're seeing there is probably uh, just a few words, maybe a sentence, and um, and then uh, we. I go through the entire book and edit out any of those things that there may have been the, the reader clearing their throat like I mentioned or um, sometimes you know we we have to have the narrator reread the same sentence or the same paragraph many times until it, they get it right um, it's not an easy thing to do um, if you talk to anyone who's narrated uh, any of these books it's a it's a, a skill that has to be developed and it's it's very difficult to to sit and read a book um, and you notice that when you read um, we have to actually read them very clearly so that can be understood every syllable and so forth and you'll you will hear uh, when Tanya plays a little section from what we've done so far um, so I do the editing and if you can see the sort of the top part of this screen uh, you can see that there are many vertical slices in, in this and every time there's a slice that means that somewhere where I've cut and um, removed some space or I've added in um, silence <laughs> so I, we have uh, recorded some silence and then we, we add some silence in there to replace maybe the sound of um, a person's mouth make, uh, or uh, breathing or, or taking an, an extra breath that you normally wouldn't have when you're reading you will remove that and all kinds of things so there are literally thousands of edits in any of these books and um, it, you can also see that Tanya has placed markers as she is recording as she's monitoring she's placing markers saying okay we had to re-record this line uh, two or three times because of this reason she's taking notes all kinds of things so you can see the sort of uh, little diamond shapes across the top uh, with words next to them and those are markers that the monitor has put in 
uh, can we go back to the previous screen? So there's the, the recording stage and then there's the editing stage. The editing would not be done there on the spot. It would be, uh, we would take this laptop, so it's a portable system that we have. I would bring this home and do the editing um, on the weekends. And then once the entire book has been recorded, now to record the entire book, there, so far we've been doing sort of two or three hour increments. So that's gonna take months to, to finish an entire book. And then once I have done all of the editing, then is the stage called quality assurance. So we are at exporting out from that Pro Tools software and then uh, someone else is gonna be going through with the, the printed out book or the digital printed out e-book, e I'm sorry, the digital um, print of it um, and, and listening and reading along and making sure that everything is exactly as is written. So that's called quality assurance. Then uh, inevitably there will be notes and we may have to get the reader back in the studio again to make revisions. And then we finish all that and we're happy with it and it's not done yet. We still have four more steps. We s then we go into that what's called Hindenburg software for the packaging and uh, adding of metadata. So if you can forward to that Hindenburg screen it's the next slide. Yeah, here it is. So Hindenburg, kind of similar to the Pro Tools, but this one we actually uh, Hi, can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay, we lost you for a moment, Jeremy, if you want to continue. Can, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Now we can. Okay, good. Um, so then we're on the um, Hindenburg screen. And when you get to Hindenburg, we're taking those digital files that we've recorded in Pro Tools and listened back to and everything and, and done uh, edits on. And then we bring that into Hindenburg and we put markers in there for what's going to be used for the talking book patrons. Their players will be able to forward to these different markers. And so, for example, this particular book has a forward. So we will do a marker for where that forward begins. As you can see at the bottom of the screen there, you can see forward, you can see part one. So we'll have points that the computer, I'm sorry, the player or the BARD app that the patron is using will be able to forward to those, to those markers and it will read it, what it's what it's supposed to say. It'll read forward, it'll read part one. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing what, what this does, but we have to go through and manually create all of these things. Um, so that's the Hindenburg software and then we export from Hindenburg and create some digital files and we'll go back to that one. Oh yeah, okay, so we see here that we have the National Library Service uh, catalog screen showing that Laughing Whitefish, the last book that we completed, um, was assigned a, a number, a catalog number of DBC 19552. It tells you that there's a running time of 11 hours and 21 minutes and it has the name of the narrator and some uh, library catalog terms like historical fiction, legal issues, things like that, a little bit of a a description of the book and then if we can go back to that screen with the workflow and then so we're then we're doing a a process that w was a learning curve for us recently it was uh, the packaging we the adding I'm sorry after the packaging and metadata we uh, are doing the validation script so this is where you get into running scripts on the computer if you know anything about that uh, anyway it's this kind of technology where you go through and make sure that there are no errors in the files and then we run what's called an encryption script so it's running a little bit of software that will encrypt this into the the format that's needed for the National Library Service players and this will protect it so it's copy protection so it can't be um, shared and copied you know and, and bootlegged or whatever um, it is what's called digital rights management. And then um, once that has been completed, 
uh, we upload the files that are completed to the National Library Service and within a short amount of time they're available for patrons across the country to be able to download them on the BARD app that they have on their uh, device or whatever or um, on the player that you see depicted here it's one of those players that has the buttons on it has a speaker and then it has the cartridges and the cartridges which are uh, mailed you know to the patron and um, you can kind of see the person is uh, putting a cartridge in or pulling one out uh, in the picture there thank you Jeremy um we have um, 10 minutes and I wanted to play a clip using BARD, the app uh, that our patrons use um, um, on an iPad, a Kindle Fire, a Droid, um, to listen to books um, when they want them. And I'll switch over to that now. Can everybody, Jeremy, can you see the BARD app? Yes, I see it. Okay. So our patrons um, can check out very a lot of books and when they want um, using the BARD app. And I'm not gonna go through the complete navigation today, but they find their books using their wish list um, and they download them from the wish list. They search for books using the BARD website and one can search for books by language um, thanks to the Marrakesh Treaty uh, there are hundreds of books in many languages, and thanks to the Marrakesh Treaty, our books will also be available to people in other country who have low vision or are blind. Um, so once they find the book that they want to read, they um, go to their bookshelf, click on audiobooks, and we're going to click on Laughing Whitefish. In this case, I have a bookmark for what we want to listen to today. And in Laughing Whitefish, uh, the young man who represents the Native American Chippewa tribe member, um, Laughing Whitefish, is um, talking about his experiences researching her case. And this first clip is what's happening in the courtroom just before the local Marquette judge gives his decision in the case. One o'clock. Even before one o'clock, the courtroom was jammed with people, whites, Indians, and colorful mixtures of the races, both young and old, men, women, and children, seated, standing, squatting. During the noon hour, the word had evidently gotten out that the Kabogam case had reached a crucial stage. It seemed the whole town had turned out to witness the imminent slaughter. As I took my place, my eyes idly swept the front row. There was good old Cash, nodding and giving me a silent handshake, and even his honor, the mayor. Ah, yes, and my landlord, the president of the bank, besides a number of stylish women, corseted and elegantly beferred. Even the town's oldest pioneer was there, resolute, silver-haired Peter White, half-dozing, looking like a somnolent lion in his inevitable suit of black broadcloth, his great powerful hands rigidly clasping his knees, his heavy gold watch chain sagging across his barrel chest, his vast bulk occupying the space of two normal-sized persons. He was, by tacit consent, oral historian of the area. He settled disputed questions on the spot out of memory, not out of books. So I hope you enjoyed that clip. Um, I wanted to play one more, but we're running out of time. So I wanted to let you know that um, I'm showing a screen um, from the second floor of the Peter White Public Library in their Michigan um, reference area. And this book is Indian Affairs, Laws and Treaties by Kepler uh, from 1904. And even though the Laughing Whitefish book was situated in historical fiction in 1873, um, I was going to play a clip when he goes to the local brand new Peter White Library on Front Street and receives a book on laws and treaties. 
and was able to solve his case and and all sorts of things. But I won't I won't ruin the book for you if you haven't read it. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, it's just nice to tie in that we still have some information at our local library uh, that ties in with the books that we're recording today. Um, Peter White Public Library is using the booth currently, particularly Marty um, Ackett's uh, is using the booth um, uh, to record Library Nerds with Words um, podcasts. And um, coming up, part of the National Endowment for the Arts effort, uh, the Big Read event, which is actually launching this evening at the Peter White Public Library, they're going to be using the booth uh, for people to create podcasts with their essays and stories and memories. So the Peter White Public Library will open up the booth for checkout sometime soon for people all over the UP who have library cards. And we're looking forward to that. And um, I wanted to also say about the clip that I played, that was written in the 1960s. So please excuse that it might have dated references and language. Um, I should have prepared you for that. Uh, but that is uh, the book that we played. Um, thank you all so much. And we have only four minutes for questions. I apologize for that but I, uh, um, please unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, I wanna let you know that my last screen has how to contact us if you have any questions um, and also the contact information for the Peter White Public Library if you're curious about when their services will open with the booth. Um, so go ahead and unmute yourself and, and say your name if you have a question. This is Blair from Speeds. Um, I had a question. Uh, how did Peter White get selected for the recording booth? Um, oh, I guess, no, never mind. That was because of the, the trust fund there. Um, no, there wasn't a particular reason. It's just that we didn't have a place to house it here at Superior Land Library Cooperative. Oh, okay, um, that's what my, sorry, that's what my, was I was leading into Tanya's, you know, sure. how did you get hooked up with everything too? Just think this is great. I'm really interested in it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, sure. So when the Superior Land Cooperative was looking at adding the recording booth, Sean did reach out to me to see if there would be enough space at Peter White to house it. It is rather large. It doesn't look as large in the pictures, um, but it is a rather large booth and it weighs um, several tons. So it had to be placed somewhere where the, the space was available, but also that the structure was able to take such a heavy, <laughs> heavy um, booth. Um, in, in the facility. So we, we wanted to keep it in a library and we were fortunate to have the space um, close by to Superior Land to be able to house this. Thank you. That was Andrea uh, Ingmeyer, the director of the Peter White Public Library. Thank you, Andrea. Tanya, this is Betsy in Lansing. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> so just, I just want to congratulate you for the, you know, the, the great team that you've got working there. Um, just for the other people who are listening, I'm the librarian um, who coordinates the service for the National Library Service for the Michigan Regional Library in Lansing. And Tanya and I have worked very closely to get everything up and running and get your software and we'll work together on, you know, selecting books, um, make sure that we don't do overlap. And I'm just really glad that everybody's working so well together. And, and you guys are doing a great job of getting, getting those books out there. So way to go. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy. For you, of course, as always. Thank, well, thank you for your support. And I should have mentioned you on the acknowledgement screen. Oh, I'm that's so okay. <laughs> nope, I fly under the radar anytime I can, but. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm just really proud of your team. I mean, it's it makes a big difference to have um, a good group of people who are working together with all the different skills that you need and, and you definitely have that there. So good job. Oh, thank you, Betsy. That means a lot. Well, unless 
anybody else has anything to say, we're right at the time. And I wanted to thank you all for your participation participation today and um thank you so much we really appreciate it. and have fun at the conference this week for all of the library people here today thank you thank you oh did you have something to say jeremy uh no i just want to say thanks everybody it's a very um it's a moving thing to to have heard um doug's speech and also, to, I'm very proud of having worked on these things because, um, you know, it was really Lynn Buckland Brown's vision, you know, to get this. And, and my, I originally had pushed just, oh, we don't need a big booth. We just need something that's like three by three, you know. But now I'm like, what, what was I thinking? You know, we really kind of needed that extra space. And if we ever want to be able to make it accessible, you know, you'd have to have a larger size. And, and um, so it's just, it's great. Well, thanks everybody, and I hope you have a great night. And this recording will be available on the Great Lakes Talking Books.org website. Thank you. Thank you.